Okay. Let's do this. Right. So, welcome everyone to another episode of Chatter. Today I'm here with Professor David Edgerton from King's College London, author of The Rise and Fall of the British Nation. Uh, Professor, welcome to the show. Thank you. No problem. So, uh, yeah, we're here in your wonderfully book-filled office, which I'm very much enjoying. Um, so the first thing I guess I would like to talk to you about is uh, the great prophet Morrissey is correct and the Queen is dead. <laughs> is this the end of the of the, the the British Empire? Is this like the end of the United Kingdom? Because that's very much what it feels like. It feels like she was the last thing kind of holding everything together. Well, the empire ended a long time ago. Um, she's held together in some respects, uh, the things called the uh, the Commonwealth. The United Kingdom is um, still together. Uh, of, of course, there are enormous uh, pressures pulling it apart. Um, Brexit perhaps being the most uh, uh, important of, uh, of, of recent years, but it builds on um, uh, vociferous tendencies which have been there for, for a very long time. Indeed, one could argue that uh, the European Union was uh, responsible for holding together the United Kingdom in the last 40 years, uh, much more so, I would argue, than the, than the monarchy, actually. That is quite a that is quite an opinion. In what sense do you in that you mean that perhaps they they kept us from becoming the the free market sort of very British exceptionalism sort of place that we might have otherwise. No, I don't. No, I don't mean that actually. Um, I think uh, uh, there are there are Brexiters who argue that the the EU was a kind of protectionist socialist bracket. Um, but that's the, that's not my take on it. What, what I mean is that that um, that the people in Scotland um, could imagine a, a world in in which they could operate uh, as easily within uh, the European Union as within the the United Kingdom. Um, that they they could, as it were, have a a, a shared set of uh, set of identities. And of course, in Northern Ireland, uh, that was blatantly obvious, wasn't it, that the, that the Good Friday Agreement um, depended on um, the, the UK being being in, in, in the EU. So mm. One could have um, effectively dual nationalities, dual uh, orient, orientations, um, and not be constrained by, by any, any physical um, border to the, to the movement of, of, of people or or, or, uh, or anything else. I think it, it, it uh, it um, uh, it it rather downgraded the significance of the United Kingdom as a political economic structure to to be in the EU, and of course that was a reason why many of the Brexiters uh, didn't like it. Mm. Now I've actually seen you in a couple of interviews talking about this this interesting paradox um, between the sort of globalist ambitions of the the more sort of Friedmanite wing of the of the Conservative Party. Uh, sort of contrasted with the what perhaps the voters might have been envisioning mm -hmm. for like yeah. a, a Britain outside of the European Union in yeah. that you know we'd start to make things ourselves again you know would be about British products and and you know that sort that sort of jazz like how do, how do you think that that sort of paradox and that that conflict reconciles itself like do, do the people just lose is is that what's going to happen like the 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 globalist thinkers are, are going to win or yes that's what's happening already isn't it uh the um yeah what i was what i was trying to get at was really uh, that uh, a lot of the the feeling that came up uh, about brexit was essentially nationalist and came from old people and the, the brexit vote is an old vote uh so what were they what were they looking for and uh, i just imagined that they were looking for this world in which cars were british and telephones were british and tv sets were, were british and and the people were were british as well uh and curiously enough that the, the brexiters the, the the leaders uh have not been of that persuasion at all i mean they they are for uh, lowering uh, tariffs getting rid of uh, uh regulation so the country will be flooded with um cheap textiles cheap shoes cheap food i mean this is this is what they were openly openly saying um but i think it's very much that wing that has that has won uh, especially i have to say with uh, the triumph of uh, of liz truss who is very much of that uh, persuasion uh, as is uh, jacob rees mogg mm. 
Um, and in fact, you know, the British government has not even imposed um, uh, controls against imports from uh, the European Union. It's, it's quite extraordinary. And in the trade deals that it's made with Australia and uh, New Zealand, or I'm not sure they're, they're all signed uh, yet, they are letting in massive quantities of, uh, of food from those, those countries, mm. uh, which will absolutely undermine the farmers of the United Kingdom. Well, what do you make of Liz Truss? Because coming from someone who so i'm i'm 28 right my knowledge of politics apart from like understanding something that's like historical it's like i've not lived through like say okay so my my first years of like watching politics even would have been like the the 2010 general election that's the first mm -hmm. like real election i remember yeah and that's when the first time we would have started to pay attention to this stuff and even in that period of time, it feels like the quality of our leaders has has just gone off a cliff. Like, and I'm, I'm, I'm tr trying not to be hyperbolic because that's genuinely what I'm looking at yeah. in terms of like their their I mean ability to even lead to formulate policy to operate as a government and not like a, a PR wing of a failing department. Is it is it just me or like you, uh, you've been watching this for like longer than I have? Yeah. Like, is it genuinely as, as bad as it's ever yeah, been? Absolutely. Or? I mean, and they can't even make a speech. I mean, they can't even do the sort of things that politicians uh, should be able to do. Uh, yes, there's been a catastrophic uh, fall in the, in, in, the, in the quality of the, of the British political class. I mean, they're a positive embarrassment. I mean, once upon a time, you know, British politicians would sneer at, uh, at, at foreign politicians as corrupt and backward. And I think the, the boot is rather on the other foot now uh, that uh, the British politicians look like kind of very sleazy um, uh, uh, operators who are in the pockets of others. I mean, it's uh, it is a, a, a very, very sad uh, decline, but a real one. What do you think happened? What happened um, was that uh, politic, British politics became less interesting, so less interesting people went into it. Um, it, it was taken over by a very particular ideological uh, um, groupings. So the Labour Party became a kind of new Labour operation and that froze out of the, of the party um uh, people had any sort of different uh, different ideas uh so the, the 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 party was left with um a a a, a tiny left uh, largely outside the the parliamentary party and a a blairite leadership essentially uh and capable of generating new new ideas uh, the the tory party i'm i'm less clear what happened um there um but i suppose in the old days um uh, uh, some of the British capitalist class had a had a greater sense of public duty and uh, and you know went into politics with a level of seriousness. I mean now I think um, some kind of low level members of the ruling class go into politics uh, in order to make money after it. Um, okay. So I so, I, so I, yeah I think it's a, it is a, it is a very different kind of kind of game and. Um, and one that I, I at least uh, don't really understand, but you're, you're absolutely right about the, the collapse in, 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 uh, in quality. Um, but we shouldn't underestimate Truss, um, just as we shouldn't underestimate Johnson. I mean, people thought he's, 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 he's just incompetent, he's just a liar, he's just this and just that. But actually, he was a very successful politician. Uh, he, did, he, did, he did get Brexit done. Uh, he, he did... Um, uh, continue the electoral success of the of the Conservative uh, Party. Uh, that's 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 quite something. And and Liz Truss is certainly more popular with uh, voters than she is with the with the commentariat. I mean, if you look at the the Starmer versus Truss uh, polls, um, they don't show her um, uh, in a disastrous position. Far from it. Well, I mean, you could probably attribute at least some of that to Keir Starmer's sparkling personality. <laughs> Well, of, no, of course, of course, of course, that's right. But uh, um, I wouldn't underestimate her, uh, and I certainly wouldn't underestimate her, her capacity to uh, pursue policies that will help her get elected in a general election in twenty twenty four. And and I nor would I underestimate her commitment to 
uh, her politics. Um, I mean, I think it's it's quite wrong to suggest that the modern Conservative Party is is um, driven simply by the desire for popularity. They have an agenda. Uh, they had Brexit. Well, the bits of the party had Brexit as agenda. They've made that the agenda of 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 the party, and Liz Truss most definitely has a, a radical Thatcherite agenda. I mean, the most this is the most right wing government uh, we've seen in in British history for a very very long time. And it's interesting that that is not commented on. And, and the Johnson government was very right wing as well, of course. Why do you think that's not commented on? Is it like an Overton window shift, or is it like an Overton window in terms of? what the press will discuss has shifted well i think there's been a uh, uh, a degradation in in our understanding of politics as well as the quality of, of the of, of, of the politicians so people are not interested in noticing what um, politicians are actually saying what they're actually arguing they just assume that they're all the same really and that they're, they're they're all they're all terrible um but no, they are they are serious people in the sense that they are they are pursuing very particular agendas, and uh, we need to pay attention uh, to that. Um, and uh, you know, I I I I think the Labour Party is wrong uh, uh, to to essentially say that the, the the Tories are incompetent, and that was the line you know right through COVID. It's the it's the line on the economy now. It's not incompetence. It's a it's a serious program to do something very different which might well lead to uh, economic disaster. It'll certainly lead to lots of British people being impoverished, mm. but um, that's maybe not their concern. And when you mention this, this that the, the policies will quite probably lead to, to people being impoverished. I look at, at the level of inequality, wealth and income yep. in, the, in the United Kingdom, and I am in no way an equity person. I don't I don't sit here preaching that we all need to, you know, equally distribute everything. I think that's a horrible idea, right? But at the same time, like it, it's very clear to me that that inequality, that it, there's there's a tipping point at which that inequality becomes revolution. Like mm -hmm. where people just like they're just like, well, we can't win on this board, so they just flip the board over. Mm. And it seems to me like no one in the British establishment, political or media, is 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 even paying attention to this as an issue because like this isn't like like a bleeding heart reason for me like going after it. It's like you all you people are gonna like lose your jobs at some point. Like if this trend continues, at some point people are just gonna lose their mind and they'll have nothing left and they just go okay right time for chaos. Like, well, maybe chaos, but not not revolution. I think I don't think poverty sorry, leads to revolution uh, at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, so and, and and I think that may have been the, the the calculation actually that you 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 can impoverish people you can increase inequality, and you can maintain yourself in power. Um, I, I I think that's that's clearly uh, doable, and that's that's indeed what they've done. And I think we you know we've got to look back at the history of this. Um, uh, the great increase in inequality started in the in the nineteen eighties. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of stabilised in many ways, but. Um, but increased in 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 others so we've we've lived with in, increasing inequality for a very long period and indeed it's been associated for much of that time with the success of the british economy uh, so that the the, the the thatcherite said we have transformed britain we've made it a better place and it's certainly true for the for the middle classes and um, and uh, and above but not for everybody uh, and that has made the political weather. So New Labour basically said, yes, you're right. Yeah. And since then, um, I mean, Labour in the, in the Corbyn period said, no, that's, things have not gone right. Uh, currently, it's unclear what Labour's position is on, on the Thatcher Revolution and New Labour. Yeah. Um, but um, the consequence of that is that we don't have any serious analysis in the political sphere of what has happened to this country over the last 40 years uh, and uh, I mean certain um, uh, certain revulsion against what has happened has been channeled precisely into brexit mm. yeah so that's been an expression of of the kind of a kind of dissatisfaction um, 
uh, that 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 that's caused by the changes that you're, you're you're talking about, but of course completely misdirected. And the, indeed, the 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 people who voted uh, for, for for Brexit in the hope that it would reduce inequality, that it would in, improve the quality of uh, jobs, are, are you know having a um, having I think a realizing that that's not going to happen. I mean, leveling up was always. Um, a, a political ploy it was never never going to be a a, a reality mm. like, what do you make of the, the case like outside of the, the the brexiteers case for brexit in the, in the sense that outside of the sort of pomp and like pr spin of mm. what, what, it, what it's about like what, what do you make of the idea that it is just better to not be linked to the european union so so explicitly and and to be not quite as tethered to a their their laws b their economies um their currency i think mm. probably most notably yeah do, do you think that there's a chance that in 40 years time we look back and go you know what we probably did the right thing <laughs> uh, yes i mean there's a chance that that happened that will happen of course there is a chance but um i'd say that that in uh i would have been quite sympathetic to a serious Lexeter position. Mm. But if the reason that you, that you give, I mean, you know, um, uh, Greece has not done well under the EU. Um, uh, the, the EU is, 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 is about enforcing kind of market uh, regimes and, and so on and so forth. But the reality was there was, there was no possibility of a Lexeter Brexit. No. None at all. Yeah? Uh, it was very clear that this was going to be a right-wing Brexit, a very right-wing Brexit, and and one which would in itself push the country to the right, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what has what has happened. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so yes, there's a possibility that in forty years' time, uh, things will develop in such a way. You think, well, actually, you know, we were able to build a, a a better country, you know, outside the the EU. But I think there's a much greater chance that actually we'll be back in the in the EU in forty years' time. When you say it's pushing the country further or will push the country further to the right, do you mean like in, se in the sense of it's making or allowing the government to be more right wing? Or do you mean it's going to have like an actual market effect on the, the public opinion? I, uh, I think British public opinion is not reflected in British politics in a way that it used to be. Uh, we have a really rather extraordinary situation where we have a politics of Brexit and a politics of the right, which is basically a politics of the old, or at least of a big chunk of old people. And the politics of the young are are just not reflected in 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 our in our national political conversation. I mean, the, the young will vote Labour. The young are progressive and in, 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 uh, across many issues and are pro-European. Yeah. Um, those sort of arguments you know, are practically invisible in the in in the bigger national conversation. So, um, I think that the move to the right is very much driven by the Conservative Party and 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 uh, and and by the and by the government and of course by by the press. Mm. Uh, I, I don't I don't think we're an inherently right wing country. Um, I, I don't think we've kind of moved collectively to the right and pushed our political leadership in, in, in that direction. Not at all. Mm. Indeed, I think Labour's making a big mistake by essentially following the Conservatives onto Conservative, uh, onto conservative ground. I mean, I, I think it's a way of alienating um, its membership, alienating actually its, uh, its voters. Mm. Yeah. The, 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 the country is a divided country. Yeah. Have you read uh, David Goodhart's book, The Road to Somewhere? Yes. Uh, it's. I thought it was probably the best assessment of the divide that we have in the country um, on like a population level, in terms of like how people, how people have like the anywheres and the somewheres groups that he kind of groups people into but also it's very clear to say no one fits perfectly in these groups yeah and i think that's crucial actually um uh and 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 people change over time and yeah so i wouldn't push that one too too hard um and you know i i, I certainly don't want to 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 argue that um that 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 your someone is 
or your elsewhereness leads directly to to your your politics. I I, I don't think I don't think it does. Um, you know, I think there are plenty of Brexiters who really are elsewhereists. Oh yeah, yeah, example. that's where it gets really sort yeah. of squirrely yeah. about it. Yeah, you get you get the 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 globalists who love Britain. Yeah. And and the 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 people who who love the idea of like a very independent Britain push in for the like a globalist agenda or a free trade like global trade yeah, like exactly. Adam Smith exactly. Um, I mean that was the genius of the Brexiters that they, on the one hand they they could be uh, free market liberals on the other hand they could be anti anti globalist Farages mm, yeah. yeah so the you've been not just a, a actually hang on we'll go this way first so you talked about 1980 as a turning point um and it's funny because i have had um an economist called mark e thomas on this show twice um i don't know if you're familiar with his work he's a runs a an organization called the 99 percent.org um and he essentially argues a very similar thing to you in that around 1980 um everything seemed to change and people will look back at the 70s and go, oh, well, we don't bother go back to the 70s. Don't be ridiculous. And then he's like, you see, if we'd had the same growth that we'd had in the 70s over the past 10 years, we would not be in the same situation we are now. So the thing that he was never quite able to explain to me is why we have this view of that period. And not just the 70s, like the 50s, 60s, 70s, we were seeing. There was, obviously, some of this growth was driven by like post-war investment and and the the need to rebuild the country and like a certain amount of technological advancement that sort of stalled mm -hmm. and there was no investment through the the war era but like why do we view that that era as such like poverty stricken stricken and and like we were you know just lazing around you know taking lsd summer of love <laughs> rubbish and then around 1980 suddenly we you know pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps and we became the yeah. The working Britain that that you know became yeah. the global powerhouse. Like, where is this narrative like coming from? Well, it's, it's very obvious, isn't it? It comes it comes from the uh, uh, the, the conservatives who who won the election in 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 nineteen seventy nine and and successfully transformed from their point of view the British economy and British way of thinking about the economy. So yes, for them the seventies was this disaster, the winter of discontent and all the rest of it, and inflation all this kind of kind of stuff. And um, the country was in decline, and they revived it. So we had this narrative of 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 uh, of decline after the, after the war uh, followed by revival and i think it's very important to to notice how powerful that revivalism has been uh, that that notion that the uk now stands proud uh, that it's a scientific and innovation superpower that it that it's uh, it needed to be unleashed from the eu to take up its uh, proper global role again uh, so this is extremely powerful and, and it's interesting that the Brexiters were revivalists rather than decliners. I mean, they, they could have said, look, we, we're in the EU, it's a disaster for our country, our country's impoverished mm. and we need to free ourselves from it. But they weren't saying that. They were saying, we're fantastically brilliant. We'll be even better uh, outside the EU. Mm. So, yes, it's a very, very powerful narrative and, uh, uh, and it, it's really interesting that to point out if you look at rates of economic growth, they've been lower since 1979 than they were up to 1979. Up to the great period of transformation in Britain was 1945 to 1975, let's say, 79. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would argue that the great period of, of transformation yeah. then happened through the 80s, but I mean, not transformation for the better. Well, then there's another, there's another, there's another, there's another transformation, yes, and, uh, uh, um, you know, it was mass unemployment. Um, there was destruction of industries. Um, there were strikes. Much more, many more strikes actually in the eighties than in the in the parts of the seventies. And um, there was a, 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 yeah, a horrendous drug property. problem. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was oh. a real transformation in the power of the British state. Mm. Absolutely. So. I came across an interview where you had discussed sort of um, technological utopian to, uh, utopianism, utopianism, no, yeah, utopianism, utopianism yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, and just the the idea of like where the future is going and sort of um, either selecting, utilizing technology rather than 
just accepting everything that comes our way. Um, first off, I was wondering if you could go a little further into a comment you made about how we have many different paths for the future rather than just needing to so go where we believe in the inevitable is. Well, I think there's a particular problem with thinking about technology, and that is that the discussion we have around technology are shaped by very particular technological interests. So we end up talking about the same thing, actually. AI is the thing of the of the moment. I mean, AI isn't the only technology around. <laughs> there are lots of different inventions which will help shape our, our future. Yeah. So the technological future is a compl complex thing. Yeah. So I think the most important thing we can do thinking about technology is just stop believing in the gurus, stop believing in the, in the propaganda, mm. um, and just looking around um, and, and thinking about what's, what's changing and, uh, and why. But the problem is that it's difficult to do that because um, technology is always a promise for the future, and mm. it's uh, an easy promise uh, to make. So you know, environmental problems, oh, well, we'll have um, hydrogen-powered airplanes. Uh, Boris Johnson would say, or electric taxis. I mean, you can come up with all this stuff and you think, oh, the, you're, this is terribly exciting. You know, uh, but if you look at it, you know, jet airplanes aren't going to happen any, uh, uh, hydrogen powered jet airplanes are not happening anytime soon. No. Yeah. And we're going to carry on building kerosene powered airplanes for many years to come. Yeah, quite possibly. Yeah. I mean, it's one of my eternal frustrations with anyone talking about you really turning the economy green I, I am so for this please start doing it before you take away the cars <laughs> like that yeah like uh well or, yes i mean why not ban large cars large engines mm -hmm. it's very straightforward um uh, and the world can be greened very very quickly if you want to do it but people see, don't want to do that mm. yeah yeah yeah, that's and all... they want to talk about it, but they don't want to do it. Yes, that's, uh, for obvious reasons. Yes. But it's, it's very interesting, uh, difficult uh, decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the technologies that, and I don't know how, how how familiar you are with this idea, so I may have to like, but I feel like you may have heard of it anyway. So there's talk at the minute about this idea of a central bank digital currency, CBDC, that would replace the the pound or the dollar or the euro. And this is one of the things that people talk about, like the a lot of the tech utopians want to, to come forth um, because it would be, it would essentially become the same thing that we have at the minute in, in that a lot of our infrastructure is digital, except the, the money would be programmable so you could determine what it could be spent on. And so, so you're saying that you've, you've not been particularly familiar with, you're not familiar with this, this concept? This, no. Okay, that's concerning. Um, because, Why is, it, is it happening it's because it's happening it's been trialed over the last two years in china uh the federal reserve or or, or yeah announced uh, their desire to do it um britain has come out as well they rishi sunak came out under the last administration and said they were they were also you know looking into launching it they were going to call it britcoin uh, <laughs> yes it's a fantastic name um but this, I was hoping that you could assuage my fears that this technology is not something that, that's coming down the line and that, you know, things that seem inevitable may <laughs> not be. Because that just feels like a really bad idea to me to allow a government to have that amount of power. I don't know if governments do have power um, uh, already, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they, it's <laughs> scary. <laughs> Um, but in I don't no I don't think it was this that interview in a, an interview for uh, with TNT actually you talked uh, someone asked you about um, modern monetary theory and this kind of links back to our our, our discussion about yeah, inequality I remember that. earlier too. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do I watched it earlier <laughs> um, it links kind of a little bit into our discussion about inequality earlier and you they they you were discussing essentially uh, a lot of the money that had been printed by. Um, the Bank of England um, through COVID and through the or in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. You're talking about um, how it seems like the government has a lot of power to do a lot of good in terms of like maintaining stability, um, mm -hmm. managing to not let things go off a cliff. And I was wondering if you still held that opinion 
um, especially when in so if I give the example of the Liz Truss has announced a plan for dealing with the energy prices mm -hmm. is to take a hundred billion roughly mm -hmm. depends how much it costs but mm -hmm. 100 billion of yeah taxpayer money put it on the bot on the the borrowing sheets and mm -hmm. then hand it to companies that have just made 170 billion in profit mm -hmm. and i was wondering if you still held that opinion about the utility of yeah a government's ability to print money when it seems to me that more and more when we do this it ends up in the hands of the richest and most powerful Mm. And that seems like you're debasing the value of the money that the everyday person has to further enrich the wealthiest. And that does not seem like a good idea to me. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I think the point I'd make is that um, that uh, governments have shown that they can use uh, financial means uh, to an extraordinary degree. Uh, these are massive interventions in 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 markets um, mm. that we're supposed not to have been able to do, uh, uh, but the government turn around and uh, and do it. Now, what they only do it for certain reasons. They do it to save banks in order to save the economy. Uh, they do it to um, keep, in particular, uh, the middle classes going in uh, in in the era of of COVID, and they they're doing it. To to, um, to 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 stop a revolt uh, uh, against the government on energy prices, but they were doing it in such a way, as you say, that the, the producers of of, uh, of 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 gas, in particular, uh, w will be paid exorbitant amounts for that for that gas. Um, so yes, uh, uh, there is a capacity to intervene, a willingness to intervene, indeed, but very very selectively. And we don't we don't uh, kind of print money to to fund social care, mm. for example. We didn't print money during the pandemic to to raise the the level of sick pay to to a, to a decent uh, decent level. Mm. Yeah. Um, in 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 we intervened to save the the, the banks after after two thousand and eight, but not to 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 keep public services going. So yes, I mean there is a very interesting new politics um, since uh, since two thousand and eight, which we we need to begin to understand uh, absolutely. And it, it is a it is about uh, intervening uh, very very selectively in the economy, but on a massive scale. And the left hasn't really woken up to this. I don't I don't think. Mm. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because like surely, because if I was still <laughs> considered myself someone who would vote for the Labour Party. I would be screaming. I would be like, look, really, like, look, they have the money. And instead of like using this ability yeah. to say fund things like you've, you've mentioned, things that could be really yeah. actually economically useful to the yeah. country, it's build like, I don't know, infrastructure to level up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yet, no one seems to have like tapped into the idea that we might be able to use this for like something that might be really popular. Yeah. Like, what do you think? Like, why do you think that is? Well, partly it's because um, Cause it's almost it's a left wing idea as well. Oh, well like modern monetary be. theory. Well, I mean, the modern monetary theory bit is a bit separate. I mean, let's well, say what what happens is yeah, is, is, I just what, mean is what's that. important. I guess I just yeah. mean in the sense. Yeah. That... But um, but yes, I mean it's. Um, uh, uh, why? Why is that? As the left, well, some, some bits of the left, of course, have understood this very, very well. Um, but I think uh, um, the Labour Party uh, has has not wanted to, to understand this because it has um, wanted to, to 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 present itself as the as the party of moderation and fiscal rectitude. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think uh, mistakenly. Um, uh, uh, wanting to 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 criticize liz truss and um and previous governments for abandoning sound money yeah uh for for not being monetarist uh, uh enough which is an extraordinary position uh, to take but but one that they are tempted to take because it, they think it shows them uh, in a in a in a good light and the tories as as incompetent mm. Like are you are you familiar with like yeah. the the theory that most of our current economic and societal woes 
at least according to this theory, it's called, uh, there's a great website that does this, called What Happened in 1971. <laughs> no. And it's the, the year that the dollar um, was decoupled from the gold standard, and then I believe it was two years later, the pound decoupled from the gold standard. Hmm. They basically argue that that has led to a debasement of our currency and mm. um, uh, we've lost um, like a, a massive amount of productivity, of economic value, of the value of yeah a lot of the, the things that we would hold aside from perhaps property and maybe um, gold, and silver, commodities and things. Do you think, maybe you don't have an, even an opinion on this, <laughs> but do you think it was a mistake to... to 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 get rid of sound money because like to me <laughs> no like to me it doesn't seem like a bad well, like it seems like a like the labor look, money money, money has always been political that. and um um uh i mean the 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 the, the dollar was in a sense based on, on on american economic power not not on gold just like sterling when it was on on gold mm. um before 1931 you know was 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 really based on on the economy and, and not on a pile of gold mm. so uh, no but uh, but it's interesting that those those sort of theories uh, mm. <laughs> are, are are appearing yeah well it's just i mean there's another set of theories then that said that that that, that, that um that, that we should base our currency on on other things like mm. energy or or something yeah there's 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 there's, there's always some kind of critique mm. of, of the economy that's based on the on the units of currency and the backing of currency but mm. Yeah, it's interesting that you find that to be like a, a new argument. Not that I, I would say that it's been around for a long time, but it's just, it's one that I have heard for, for a number of years, but yeah. then that's only in my sort of short amount of time, like looking no, at No, I mean, it's certainly not a new argument. I mean, the, the uh, uh, it's a very familiar argument in, in British history that, uh, that, that, that the currency should be uh, based on gold and um, um, sound. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So to take us back to sort of Brexit and the rise and fall of, of Britain, mm -hmm. what do you think is going to happen over the next few years? Because like I remember throughout the, the, the Brexit campaign and in the years since, there was, I would say, both founded and unfounded hysteria about how Britain was going to cope post-Brexit. You know mm. what was going to happen to our economy, what was going to happen to our politics, mm. and whether we were going to become very isolated within the world. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's that that we are going to see like a serious period of decline, or do you think this is just a bit of overblown? No, I mean, I I think uh, the uh, the analyses of the impact of uh, Brexit um, have been broadly correct. Um, the the um, the, the projections for the the growth of the economy um, slowing down compared to what it could have been um, seem to be holding up pretty well. Um, the uh, the sense that, uh, that 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 British politics uh, would get more toxic has certainly played out. The sense that the UK would lose international standing uh, it obviously has uh, uh, as well. And Brexit isn't finished. Um, I, I, I think there are very stormy waters ahead. Uh, and I, again, I don't think this is sufficiently reflected in, in, in British political discourse. Uh, uh, nobody really wants to, to challenge the government on the Northern Ireland uh, protocol. Because <laughs> no uh, one has any idea what to do about it. Well, uh, <laughs> that's so that's, clueless. That's so, so revealing, isn't it? Yeah. Because um, uh, other countries aren't pissing about in the way that British politicians are with this question. Uh, Joe Biden isn't going to let it happen. Mm. Yeah? And it's very interesting what's been happening over the last few days. I assume it's related to Northern Ireland Protocol, this failure or this the disinvitation of Liz Truss. Uh, uh, oh, I read with, that uh, it was because her chief of staff is reportedly under investigation by the FBI. Yeah, that that is happening, but I I don't suppose that would uh, stop a meeting. I think I imagine it's something much more serious than that. Okay. Um, and uh, of course, the European Union would, would take uh, um, a a, um, a a movement to 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 bring um, the Northern Ireland Northern Ireland uh, uh, Protocol, whatever it's called, act into in in into force very seriously uh, indeed. Mm -hmm. um, so. 
some things are going to happen. <laughs> and if if she she doesn't push through with with this, she will she will be pulled down by the ERG, by the Brexiters in in in, in the government. This is a government so essentially a Brexit, even more of a Brexit government than the than the Johnson government, and she's she's in power courtesy of the headbanging the most headbanging Brexiters. And they they have demanded. Do you think they'd really pull down a fourth prime minister? No, yeah, absolutely they could. It's not they could. It's what would they? It's like, like, what, what, do, we, do we turn it into Italy? We've had like four prime ministers in six years. Like, surely at some point they have to realise that people are just going to get pissed off with them, like constantly changing leaders mid term. Well, but they've they've got bigger fish to fry. I mean, they they are serious. They 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 are serious about Brexit. They are serious about the kind of Brexit that they 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 want to see, even if they don't really understand it. They are serious. They're deeply committed to this, uh, and that's why the Conservative Party members voted for Liz Truss, and that's why she was supported by the people she was supported by. That's why she's got Jacob Rees-Mogg in uh, the business department. Mm. They are not messing about. So you think this is almost like, like some sort of like last chance, hail Mary, like let's get this blasted through before we're out of power for twenty years, kind of thinking? Um, well, maybe, but they. Uh, I mean, I think it's an element of that, but uh, but uh, I I I think they just want to do it, and th this is what they're in business to do. Um, and we're not. And th and this go back to a point I made earlier. I don't I don't think. There is much understanding of the of the transformation that Brexit has affected in 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 British politics. It's shifted the Labour Party as well to, to a position of silence on some very important questions. Um, but most importantly, it has transformed the Conservative Party into an entirely kind of hard right, Brexit obsessed party. Yeah. And they're prepared to trash British business, they're prepared to trash the relationship with the United States, which would be unthinkable. Both those things would have been unthinkable 20 years ago. Yeah. And they're doing it. Yeah, well. And they, they're, they are, they, you know, they are, have been uh, extraordinary cavalier with the, with the politics of, of, of Northern Ireland. It's one of the most disgusting things I've seen in my, in my political life, actually. Uh, the, effectively, the incitement of violence or the threat of threat that violence would be incited mm -hmm. to, 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 to undermine an agreement that the British government signed mm. and, knew, and knew exactly what it was signing. Yeah. And on top of that, we've got the systematic mendacity of British politics. Uh, it didn't start with Brexit. Um, um, uh, I think the Iraq war mm. was hugely important in, in that. Uh, eroded trust in the British state massively. And not just on the left, also on the right, um, and we're living with the with the with the consequences of a of a deeply polluted public conversation about about the present and the future, and indeed the past, actually. So, like, to try and end this on a more positive. <laughs> well, po yes, the well, positive note is is I think uh, is this that um, that younger generations. Uh, I can see through this. They're media savvy. They uh, are appropriately cynical about about a political um, a class and the press. Uh, they just they just don't believe it. And I said earlier, uh, uh, we have a, a, a politics of the old dominating the public the public sphere. There's an entirely different politics which is which is rather rather submerged. When do so, you see that tipping? Like is it like that, that? That implies that there's a tipping uh, point that will happen. Yeah. At some point. Yeah. 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 When do you think that will be? I, you don't buy I, the I, adage that you know people are going to get old and get conservative. Uh, no, uh, not necessarily. Um, uh, uh, and there may become a disaster, and so on, so on and so forth. No, I think things will change, uh, and I think one of the, one of the things that's changing uh, um, moment is the is uh, the in increasing activity of the trade unions. That's 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 really important, mm. and in fact, we in the universities, you know, have been on have been on strike in, in the last three years, you know, m more than ever before by a country mile, um, uh, and now you know, we've got uh, postal workers on strike, railway workers. Um, there'll be many, many more strikes.
BT, I believe, were on strike. BT, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's a, a um, something 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 new is is uh, is is happening, and we have a, a new generation of uh, trade union leaders that are clever, that are uh, tactically clever and um, politically clever as well. I mean, I think I think the most st- the most thing that will stick with me from the the rail workers strike from this summer is how talentless and stupid almost that Mick Lynch made journalists and politicians alike look like the it really yeah. brought in the stark clarity the lack of talent yeah in that sphere yeah. when because all he did was go on there and sensibly explain the situation yeah. Like he didn't spin it. Yes. There was no like you don't have to be a trade unionist to agree with everything he said. Yeah. You know. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily see it as lack of talent. I, I see it slightly differently. Uh, 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 and I think what's hap- happened over the years is that the journalists have been pushing uh, uh, very particular agendas and have understood the world in very particular ways, and um, the opposition has really fallen in with those ideas. So the journalists have never been challenged. Um, and when he turned around and basically said, well, I don't accept the premise of your argument, they didn't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. It was so quite lovely it, to see. It, it was. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, let's have, let's, have, let's have more of that. We really, we really do need it. I mean, people are cowering uh, in front of the BBC, in front of the, of the, of the national press, uh, uh, our, our, the political class, uh, just not prepared to speak out and tell it as it is mm. and, but you know that will that will that will change because somebody will come up and uh, and and speak for people yes tune into this show <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for my final question <laughs> um, I have been pondering this for quite a while it's I remember being told by my history and politics teacher in school who taught me many things. Uh, and the biggest, one of the biggest lessons I learned was like moments of crisis and upheaval tend to produce new parties. Mm-hmm. Now, pre-2016, you could argue that UKIP were filling this sort of void. There was something bubbling under the surface. There was that sort of anti-European, anti-establishment then that was running there was this somewheres idea there was there was like something bubbling under the surface and and they tapped into it and yet since then we have had the most mad and chaotic five or six years that i think you could possibly have written i think if you'd been drunk and said gone into a writer's room and said write the most ridiculous things that you will imagine happen they would have come up with things that were half as ridiculous as what has gone over the mm. last six years in some yeah. cases. Yeah. Anyway. Well, yeah, but, <laughs> but the, so, the, so where is where is yeah. the new party? Like, well, it's very difficult. I mean, the the uh, uh, the, uh, the the UK case is an interesting, one, isn't it? Because they and the, and, and the Brexit party, they they managed to get what is it two MPs, but they're both defectors. Mm. If I remember if I remember yeah. correctly, they never they got anyone like, elected. I don't yeah. think. Would they have nearly five million votes and they got one MP? Yeah, uh, but they they of course had a tremendous effect on politics. They transformed the Conservative Party. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the case of Labour, uh, we did have a transformation. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn came in, and actually, in my view, saved the Labour Party. And the, yes. the Labour Party uh, was down to twenty nine percent of the vote, and uh, and under. In that period, when it when it did have something to say, it it took the vote up to forty percent in twenty seventeen. Yeah, or half a percent uh, off of Theresa May. Yeah, yeah, and um, of course things were very different in in uh, in twenty nineteen. But that wasn't the worst result uh, since nineteen thirty five, as is uh, claimed. Uh, by uh, it certainly wasn't. So there was the, there was a moment of 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 of, of change there, a moment of opportunity. Um, but yes, with a two-party system, uh, the first past the post, um, it's very difficult. Mm-hmm. But we need to think about the case of Scotland and to some extent of, of, of Wales and certainly also Northern Ireland, where new parties uh, have emerged. Mm-hmm. Uh, partly, as to be said, um, 
um, the, the real strengthening has happened uh, because of an element of PR in some of the in some of the uh, uh, elections. But you know, nevertheless, in the in the in the Westminster elections, the, the SNP do very very well on the first past the post system. So yes, it it is difficult to break the the, uh, the British uh, the British party system, um, but it you know it has been transformed in in quite interesting ways in in recent times. But the, clearly there are um, many many voices that are not represented in 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 Parliament: um, green voices, left voices, regional voices. See, I would I would argue that that both major parties have essentially abandoned their membership at this point like the the labor party last estimates i saw were down to 200,000 members yeah from like nearly 700,000 yeah. when jeremy corbyn was at the head was it that high yeah, yeah it was 695,000 yeah. i think that, that the estimate was mm -hmm. at one point mm -hmm. and yet now they're down to an estimated 200,000 mm -hmm. the conservative party have as far as i can tell essentially betrayed almost all of their fundamental values aside from now they're back to you know tax cuts for the rich and mm. um, they their idea of like fiscal responsibility is completely blown out of the water um the the sort of defending of more huh. maybe socially conservative and traditionalist ideas like it does, they don't have to be opposed to to like gay marriage or something for them to like at least back up some of the more traditionalist ideals that would come from say a lot of the conservative membership and i just i wonder like where where are all these people going like who who are all these people going to vote for that that are abandoned in both parties in in a sense well uh, uh, um the labor party i suppose i think a lot of those people will vote labor or won't vote uh, and will vote green mm -hmm. um I mean, that'll be the left alternative um the Conservative Party, I wouldn't see it quite as you've seen it, actually. I, certainly the membership has gone down. But in that particular case, uh, the membership has been very influential. I mean, the, 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 the membership became Brexit a membership. Uh, and as elected, you know, Boris Johnson, no, not Boris, he wasn't, a, he wasn't elected, was he, by the membership? But uh, is that, I can't remember now. <laughs> he was. No, he was. He was. He was elected by the membership. Against uh, uh, there was Sajid ja Javid, Dominic Rab. Uh, so there were, who were the two that went to? <laughs> it's all gone. Actually, How embarrassing I to remember this. I can't remember. Yeah, um, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, Liz 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 uh, uh, Liz Trust has definitely been elected by uh, by that membership. Yes, the same yeah. the, the the membership that yeah. would still elect Boris <laughs> if he was on the ticket. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Which is yeah. shocking. Yeah, but anyway. Um, so, so I, 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 think the, the Conservative Party is a is 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 a, is an interesting case of a of a of a of a of a reducing party, but where the where the membership, um, does have a a very particular line, and and I certainly wouldn't agree with you the notion that the the, the Conservative Party is the party of fiscal rectitude and all, all that stuff. That's a particular argument that they've they've they wanted to make in 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 particular context but in 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 others of course they're perfectly happy to to um to borrow yeah and, I, I, and, long, I, and long have been yeah i mean more sort of just traditionally how they would have been viewed or the people who would have considered themselves to be fiscal yeah. conservatives would have voted conservative like i don't yeah. think people who were fiscal conservatives would have been happy to vote for tony blair's labor party or um jeremy corbyn's labor party for sure yeah uh, maybe not even gordon brown but uh, yeah. and this is this is like maybe this is just based on the people that i know but a lot of the people that i know that would consider themselves to be right wing wouldn't touch the tories with a 10-foot pole mm -hmm. and it's like i struggle to find someone who's a genuine conservative who thinks the conservative party are conservative it's just I mean, yeah maybe that's just like my yeah bias. it's complicated i mean because you, of course you could argue that that uh, a conservative party would be about conserving traditions and conserving um existing forms of authority and, and clearly since that mm. the conservative party has not not been like that um yeah um yeah but but it is important to note that this conservative party uh, is very keen on culture wars issues, so it it is it is speaking to a certain kind of cultural conservatism for sure. Anyway, uh, I have taken up 
more than enough of your time, <laughs> David. You. So I, I want to thank you. It's It's been really interesting to chat. I love to get the perspective of people who have lived through a bit more of this than I have and aren't coming at it with such naive eyes as myself. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to do you want to just uh, tell people uh, where they can find your book and find you and, and anything you want to plug before we finish? Oh, well, you can find my book, I, I hope, in any good uh, bookshop. It's called The Rise and Fall of the British Nation, published by Penguin in 2019. Wonderful. Right. Well, I will put that and uh, links for your website and stuff in the description for people. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. If you want to leave us a comment, that would be awesome. Please like, share, subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple, please leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.